Okay, we're in Genesis chapter 15 today, and we're going to be looking at the most frequent command that is in the Bible. It is the command, do not smoke cigarettes, right? <laughs> or do not drink, or do not go to bed with anybody other than your husband or wife. All those are probably decent commands, but this is not the most common command you see in the Bible. The most common command in the Bible is the command, do not fear. And we're looking at it today because here at Genesis 15, verse 1, is the first time that that command appears in the Bible. The very first time that this command appears, although it does appear after this, over 300 times more. Words to that effect, anyway. Why is it, you think, why is it that this is the most frequently repeated command of the Bible? Why does God keep saying, don't fear, do not fear, have no fear? Because we are so afraid all the time. It's why. It's because that's our biggest problem, fear. We don't think it is, maybe, but it is the biggest problem we have, so God addresses it more than he addresses basically any other problem. There was a, a survey, a study, done by Chapman University just a few years ago, and they came up with the 20 most common fears in this country. I'm not going to go through all 20, but I do want to look at the top seven. We'll start from number seven and work our way to number one. Number seven, the seventh most common fear is the fear of flying. Fear of flying. I have that a little bit. Number six, the sixth most common fear is claustrophobia. Did you know that many people were afraid of Santa Claus? I mean, that's ridiculous, right? <laughs> number, that's what it is, right? <laughs> number five, number five, a fear of blood and needles, blood and needles. Uh, if you're in the medical profession, you need to find a new job. Number four, the fear of drowning. Number three, the fear of bugs, snakes, and other animals. Number seven, fear of heights. I've got that one too. And number one, this is the number one on almost all surveys, a fear of public speaking, which tells you why I'm so messed up. I mean, it's, it's true. I mean, I, 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 I do public speaking every week. But I come in every single week afraid. I do. I mean, I've got to fight it. I've got to fight the fear. I've got to ask God to help me. I've got to replace fear with faith. The, the deal is, I, I come in because it's what I think God has called me to do, and so I feel a responsibility to do it, and I'm afraid I'm not going to do it well. And so it's a, a, weekly, a weekly struggle. It's something that, again, you've got in some area of your life. So what's, what's this really all about? What does it have to do with Abraham? Why is it coming in at this point in the story of Abraham? So let's read the story where we are today, at least in this story, in Genesis chapter 15, just the first six verses, where it says, after these things, and we'll talk about what things in just a moment, <clears throat> after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not fear, Abram, I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. And <clears throat> Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless and the heir of my house as Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Since you have given me no offspring, have given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, This man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your body, he shall be your heir. And then God took him outside and said, now look toward the heavens and count the stars if you're able to count them. And he said to them, so shall your descendants be. And then how did Abraham respond? He responded, it says, believing. Then he believed in the Lord and God reckoned it to him as, as righteousness. So what's the context of all of this? Some of you are coming in like in the middle of a movie and you're going, okay, I don't get what this is all about. What has happened so far as we've looked at Abraham? Abraham was not a, a follower of God. He was some heathen living out in the, in the Middle East somewhere. God comes to him for reasons that, that we don't see as very obvious and just says, you, Abraham, I'm choosing you. I'm going to make a great nation out of you. What you need to do is get up and go. Where do I go? I'll tell you when you go where to go. And Abraham does it. And God is pleased with that faith. Now, that first call that God had on Abraham was a conditional, a conditional promise, really, because what he told Abraham, he said, I'm going to make of you a great nation, many nations, in fact, but you've got to go. And although it wasn't worded in a way that you might see it as a condition, the condition to go was the condition on the promise that Abraham was going to meet a, be made into a great nation. And now we're coming to a point where years have gone by, I guess, and there's still no, no child 
no child, and Abraham's going, how can I be a great nation if I'm not having any kids? And so he rationalizes and said, well, maybe it'll come through this servant I've got in my, my household. I'll adopt him, call him an adopted son, and, and then I'll have, I'll have children through him. And this is where he comes with, with God. He's in a situation where if God has promised him kids, <clears throat> Abraham is facing the facts of his and his wife Sarah's age. They're, they're getting really, really old, and it didn't look good for them. God had this talk, though, with Abraham, showing him the stars, and Abraham then believes God for the promise again, and it says at that point, <clears throat> Abraham is saved. Abraham is saved. You, you say, when did Abraham first get saved? This is when Abraham got saved, because the belief he had, God counted as righteousness, how did people get saved in the Old Testament? By faith. By faith in the promises of God. Now, with Abraham, we've got some weird stuff that went on, we talked about last week a little bit, where he actually was looking forward beyond what he saw with his eyes to a future that included a Messiah and a heavenly Jerusalem that descends down to earth. I mean, he saw all that, and he had faith in it. And that faith is something that God's recognizing continues on now as he believes God for these children, plural, that that he has not yet seen and that the circumstances say don't look likely to occur. And God says, that's it, that faith, that believing, I'm choosing to count as righteousness in you. That faith has made you right before me. Now, what's going on though with Abraham and all this? I mean, what has been going on inside him? What's going on inside him at the moment, at the time of this discussion with God? How does this work out where Abraham is moving from fear to faith because obviously he was afraid. God said don't have fear because he had fear in him. He was afraid that he wasn't going to be up to the task of having the kids that were going to be the, the ones that brought about the, the great nation that, that numbered the stars that were like the sands on the seashore. He didn't see it happening. He didn't see how he could make it happen. And so he's afraid that it's not going to happen. And yet he then has faith. What's going on? Well, it doesn't tell us in Genesis 15, 1 to 6. It just said he was afraid, God showed him the stars, and then he believed. So what, what made him believe? Fortunately, we've got more in the Bible that does explain it. We've got Romans chapter 4. Because Romans chapter 4 takes this episode, takes us behind the scenes with this and other episodes in Abraham's life, and gives us an insight into his thinking, into his feeling, into his heart, into what was going on. It tells us that that Abraham was operating with what, what I've been thinking of the past 25 or 30 years as a fulcrum of faith, a fulcrum of faith. You know what a seesaw is, right? Seesaw or uh, uh, the scales of justice, wherever you want to look at. The idea is that the scales go back and forth or the seesaw goes back and forth and whatever is weightier carries the day. And what we see as we look at Romans chapter four is there was a fulcrum of faith that's coming into play here that that we have this insight from Romans chapter 4 that shows us how, how Abraham moved from fear to faith. And it's put here, not just for information, but for application on how we can move from fear to faith. So let's take a look. Romans chapter 4, 18 to 21, where it says about Abraham, in hope against hope, he believed so that he might become a father of many nations, according to to that which had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body. He's facing the fact he's an old man. Now as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, and the, descend and the deadness of Sarah's womb, and she's pretty old too. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. Okay, so you got it now, right? Okay, the, the idea is here, this is where the fulcrum comes in, because what it's talking about here is a picture of a man, a man that is struggling with an unfulfilled promise and how he chose to give more weight to God's promises than to the circumstances, to the facts that were right in front of him. What's going on is we see a man growing in faith, a man growing in faith. Abraham is like us. You didn't get your faith dumped on you with a dump truck when you got saved, and then that's all there is. You were given a deposit of faith, and that faith is something that then grows. We nurture it. We participate in the process of seeing faith grow into something more, and this is what we're seeing with Abraham, how his faith grew. And again, it's put in Scripture for our instruction on helping us to know how our faith is going to best grow. Abraham 
came to know the difference between facing the facts and focusing on the facts. He was not playing the glad game where he just ignored the fact that he and Sarah were both old. He was facing the reality, the truth that they were old, but at the same time, he wasn't focusing on those things and making that the primary area where he was going through this constant, constant struggle. The idea is that you, you don't have to, to feel faith to have faith. You don't have to feel you're all that to have it. He, he didn't have to stand in front of a mirror and say, I declare that I am a 25-year-old virile male. I mean, he, he didn't have to play games with it. He didn't have to make himself feel like he was. He just had to believe God's promise. That's the thing. That's the difference. It's, it's the difference between playing games of faith and having biblical faith, of, of playing games where you're declaring an unreality and facing the realities before you, but putting God in a place where he's bigger than the reality you're facing. I can remember so clearly, years and years ago, it's part of a, a charismatic church in central Florida, wonderful church, but we were at a Bible study one night, and this lady came in sick as a dog. I mean, she was, her eyes were all red and puffy, she, her nose was running, she was sneezing, she was coughing, and we're going, oh, can we pray for you? You're sick. I'm not sick. I'm not sick. Well, what's the matter? I mean, what's going on? She said, I'm not sick. I declare I am not sick. <laughs> and, and she persisted with that for the next week or so until she got over the cold. But the, the idea was she had this idea that if she just declared it wasn't so, it wouldn't be so. Now, you know, I, and that's a whole area of theology, naming it and claiming it. But, but we believe it and receive it is the difference. We don't name and claim something and then it happens because we've named and claimed it. We believe the glory of God, the weight of God, the power of God, and we receive then from God what he wants to give us with the faith that we have in God. You go, what's the difference? A big difference. Because in one instance, we're declaring that we're something and making it something by what we say. In the other instance, we're looking to God. We're putting weight on God. We're putting ourselves in a position where we're giving glory to God. When we're looking at this, it's talking here about giving glory to God. It's what Abraham did. He gave glory to God in the face of his circumstances. The Hebrew word for glory is kabod. And what, what does that mean? It means weight. It means the weight. It means literally the weight of all that God is, of all that God is. And what Abraham learned to do probably as he was looking at the stars in the sky when God take him outside to have that talk with him, he's, he's considering the weight of who God is, the weight of the reality of the creator of the universe, the weight of the promises that he's given, and he's putting the, the weight on God as opposed to the weight on his old body. I mean, it's a reality he's old, but the weight of his concept and perception of who God is was, was so much greater than the weight of, of the circumstances. And it's the same with us all the time. I mean, we've got circumstances that we're facing, and they can be weighty. But the, the truth, the simple truth, and this is brought out again in, in Romans 4 for our good, the simple truth is that the weight of God and his promises and who he is, is, is so much weightier than any weighting circumstances that we're going against. So the fulcrum, the fulcrum. Make sure that you've got a focus on the glory of God, on the circumstances. Yes, they're there, but on the glory of God that outweighs those circumstances with, with, who, with who he is and what he's ready to, what he's ready to do. It's, it's the idea that we need to get to the point where when we see something that weighs us down, we remember what we saw before. Abraham had seen God. He saw God. He talked to God. So this is where the seesaw comes in. You're going to see things, but remember what you saw. We're going to see things that, that challenge us, but remember what we saw in terms of what the promises of God are and what God has said in terms of what the Word has said. Let's take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. It says there, Therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight, kabod, of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Again, the glory outweighing the, the afflictions, the glory of God, the weight of God outweighing the, the afflictions that we have. 
what really, right now, think about it, what are the facts against you right now? What are the facts that you're facing right now? Don't, don't say they're not there. They are there. What are the facts that you're facing? What are the failures that you are dealing with right now? What are the feelings that are attempting to rule over you? Be honest. Think about them if you can for just a few seconds here. And then ask yourself, where am I giving the most weight? To the circumstances? To the feelings? To the failures? Or to, or to God? Okay. Now, if you're struggling with that and going, well, I'm giving more weight to the circumstances because they're there. I see them, and I don't remember what I saw. Well, think about wording it a little bit differently. Instead of weight, what does weight mean? It means glory. What are you giving more glory to? Are you giving more glory to the bad report you got from the doctor than to the promises of God? Are you giving more glory to the, the bank statement that says you got $2 left in the account or or? To God, are you giving more glory to the, the fact that your, your wife or husband is not as loving and kind and understanding as you are yet, or, or are you giving more glory to, to God? It, it's, it's a reality that, again, we, we need to think about, that as we give weight to these things, we are giving, in fact, glory to these things. Now, I don't know what the word glory brings up in you. But when I think of the word glory and giving glory to something, there's not very many things I want to give glory to. And I certainly don't want to give glory to some of the junk going on in my life. And this is, this is what Abraham was being instructed by God to, to deal with, to understand where, where to, to give glory. Now, what, what happened with Abraham here is the same thing that happens with us. Let's take it to a very practical, everyday level. What happened with Abraham is he was going through the, the what ifs, the what ifs. I mean, God the creator had told him he's going to have children, but he's saying, what if I can't do it? What if Sarah's not up to it? What if I can't do it, God? What if Sarah can't do it, God? What if somebody kills me first, God, before this happens? I mean, what's happening here is we've got Abraham that is insecure about his ability to see the promises of God fulfilled. This is something that's, that's not uncommon. The deepest insecurities that most of us have in life is usually connected to the assignment God has for you. The, the insecurity, the biggest insecurity that, that you have in life is most often, often connected to the assignment God has for you. The assignment God had for Abraham was to have kids and see multiplication happen. And so with that assignment, he had insecurity. I told you before, I come in afraid every, every, every Sunday or whenever I'm called to preach. Yesterday, even for the, the volunteer breakfast, I'm supposed to stand up and say something and I was afraid. It's, it's the idea that I think it's not an excuse. I, I don't want to be fearful, but, but the insecurity and the fear is most likely to come in for me in areas where I'm called to do that because it's what I've been assigned to do by God. And the same thing is true for you. Whatever your area is that God has assigned you to, it's the area where the enemy is most likely to attack to try to bring up, raise up, cause the focus to be on that area of insecurity. And, and this is where, again, the fulcrum comes back into play. The idea that I'm going to put more weight on, on the glory of God, the promises, the assignment that he's given than I am on the circumstances that seem like they're getting in the way of, of that, that assignment. We, we really... This is, okay, this is the way I think. You're going to think it's twisted. Maybe it doesn't apply to you. But <clears throat> we don't worry so much about what if God can't. But what we do is we worry about what if I can't or what if they get in the way or whether, or whether the right people won't cooperate. But, but here's the thing. If, if God calls you and me to do something, we have to remember how big he is that he knows everything that's going to happen, that he knows everything that could get in the way, that he knows all the weaknesses that we've got in us, that he knows our predispositions, and he knows the potential obstacles that are going to be there. So when we doubt our capacity to do what God has said to do, we are really doubting God and not ourselves. I mean, the thing is, most of us aren't willing to say, I don't think you can do this, God. But when we say, to an assignment he's giving us, given us, I don't think I can do this, God. And, and we know or should know the bigness and sovereignty of this God who's given the assignment, then 
what it means is that we're doubting him. We're doubting him ultimately. And this is where the enemy wants to get us. The, the what if they get in the way, what if I can't handle it, is, is the idea, again, that we don't think God can handle it. If I believe God made me the way I needed to be and put me where he wanted me to be, if I believed that with certainty, it would kill all the what ifs. It would kill the what ifs. And, and that's where some thinking needs to come into play in terms of who God is. Any view of God's will that doesn't accommodate your mistakes is too narrow a view of God. Any, any view of God's sovereignty that doesn't take into account your weaknesses is seeing a God that's way too small. Any, any view of God's sovereignty that's not big enough to take into account the flaws that you and I are going to have in character is a false view of God. I mean, the idea is he knows what's going to happen. He knows who we are. This isn't accommodating sin. This isn't saying don't worry about sin or not repenting or whatever. But it is saying God knew. He knows all the obstacles that are coming in, in us and around us. And, and he's going to bring about the purposes that he has for us. And, and it puts us in a place, hopefully, where, where the what ifs get put in the right place. See, <clears throat> what ifs are not always a bad thing. What ifs can be a good thing in terms of planning. I mean, again... For me, every Sunday, uh, I come in here thinking purposely, what if my microphone doesn't work? I'm going to be ready to grab a handheld. What if the, the verses don't come up on the screen? I bring my Bible in every Sunday. What if I left my zipper down and I make sure I check it every... I do. I check it every time I get up on stage. I mean, these are what ifs that are good planning. You need to do these things. You t- the what ifs that come into play. But, but what happens is as we we practice planning using our what ifs, then before we know it, we've moved from planning with the what ifs to the fear that comes in with the what ifs that go beyond planning. And on the one hand, we're, we're planning in a way that, that's going to help us move into God's purposes. On the other hand, we're playing into the enemy's purposes to freeze us up. Abraham, I, I think, started with some what ifs on the good side of the, the ledger when he was first called by God to, to go, to take off, to head for Canaan. I mean, he had something in his mind, I'm sure, that was saying, what if I actually move out and I become the father of, of many nations? And, and that was good. But, but then, you know, it's switched around here as they become part of, of something a lot more negative. Don't let the what ifs freeze us from stepping into everything that God wants. Don't let them keep us. From, from believing that God is who he said he is. That is, that he is the God who is with us, who loves us, the God who is a shield to us. That's what he told Abraham. I'm your shield. I'm your shield, Abraham. And it's for us too. Let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 41, verses 9, 10, and 13, where God says the same thing to Israel and it applies to us too. Isaiah 41, verse 9 says, You whom I have taken from the ends of the earth, that's Israel, that's you, that's me. You who have taken from the ends of the earth and called from its remotest parts and said to you, you are my servant, I have chosen you and not rejected you. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not look anxiously about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's a promise from God. That's a promise from God for you, for me. He intends us to believe it. Verse 13 goes on and says, For I am the Lord your God who upholds your right hand, who says to you, do not fear, do not fear, I will help you. Do you know how you can know that you have what it takes to do what God has called you to do? By having God called you to do it. That's it. If God has called you to do it, then you have what it takes to do what God has called you to do. It's as simple as that. If you don't have it, he didn't call you to do it. He, he's going to see it fulfilled. He's going to see your purpose is fulfilled. He's going to see my purpose is fulfilled in, in our lives. If he's called you, <clears throat> you have what it takes. So don't shrink back. Don't shrink God down to the size of a scenario that you can't understand in the present. I mean, that's what Abraham was doing. He, he had a scenario that he didn't understand at the moment. 
He didn't understand how can a 100-year-old guy, how can an old guy and old guy's wife have a baby? He didn't understand that scenario. And so momentarily, at least, he was shrinking God to the size of the scenario that he couldn't understand. And God wants us again to move away from from having that much weight put on the scene, on the circumstance, and, and move into the weight that's put on his promises and, and the bigness of who he is. Abraham chose not to be afraid, but to instead believe God. He, he moved in this place where, where faith replaced his fear, where he understood that although what ifs may pop up, that he would go back to that fulcrum of faith and, and intentionally think through who it was that he believed, and by thinking through it, give more weight, give more glory to God. You know, <clears throat> some people say, you know, you don't want to make Christianity a head game. You don't want to make it all about thinking, and you don't want to make it all about thinking. But if you don't make it any about thinking, you don't have Christianity. I don't know what you have. You've got to think in order to feel. You've got to feel in order to think rightly. They go together. They both come into play. But you've got to think about the gospel. You've got to think about the claims of Jesus Christ. You've got to think about the promises of God. And then you've got to choose in your thinking whether your focus is going to be on the circumstances that surround you or on the promises that God has, has given. It, it's the idea of thinking through it maybe in a, a little bit further manner by choosing to think with a no matter what attitude. And what I'm thinking when I think of that is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, the, the three young guys that were taken captive along with Daniel in Babylon. They, they're ordered to bow down to this, you know, idol, and they refuse to bow down to the idol. They say, you better bow down or you're going to get thrown into the fiery furnace. And they understood the fiery furnace was going to probably burn up whoever got thrown in there. But what did they do? Just what Abraham did, just what we're called to do, they put more weight on who their God was than on the fiery furnace. And they said, we're not going to do it. Our God can save us. Our God will save us, they said. But then they tacked onto that something that, that's helpful for us too. They said, our God can save us. Our God will save us. But let me just explain in the, the remote possibility that our God doesn't come through the way we think he's going to come through, we still aren't going to bow down to that idol. And no matter what, we're in God's corner with this. No matter what, we're hiding behind God's shield on this. And no matter what attitude that doesn't put God to the test of coming through the way we think he's supposed to come through, but we stand with him, again, believing his promise in the way that he intends for that promise to, to ultimately come about. Okay, winding this up real quickly here. What do we do as we go out? We remember, hopefully, that there is a God we remember that he knows your name, that he is a God who created you, just like these, these kids up here that we dedicated a few minutes ago. He knows their names. He knew their names before they ever called out, their parents ever called out their names. He knows what your name is. He knows where you are. He knows the circumstances of your life. He knows the assignment that he has for you. He knows the struggles that you have. He knows the opposition coming in. He knows the fear that's welling up in you. He brought you here today because he knows you're struggling with some fear. He brought you here today because he wants you to look at his word and his promises and how big he is and know that he wants you to understand how to operate with a fulcrum of faith in your life where you put more glory on him and his promises than you do on whatever the circumstances are, that you do on whatever that, that, that medical report said, whatever the, 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 the stock market's doing, whatever your spouse, your kids said or did, you're putting more weight on that than on I'm putting more weight on God than on any, any of those things. And, and in the process of it, what, what happens? God says, I like that. I like that. Your belief is, is an exhibition of righteousness. Your belief is, is a point at which additional grace is going to be poured in. This is, this is how God operates all through Scripture. He knows you. He knows your name. He's, he's with you always. He's a shield to you. He will see that you fulfill his purposes in your life, he is completely for you, and he has all the power in this universe to accomplish the purposes he has. Now, I'm going to throw a qualifier in here. We're talking about God's purposes, not yours. We're talking about what he wants, not what you want. 
Now, as we get our heads on straight, we start lining up our desires with God's desires. We have the desires of the Father. We have the desires of the Father become what our desires are, and then that, that coalescing of desires brings us to the point where we see the will of God working out in our lives, and we've got a point at which we can actually put faith in what God is doing. We want to resist the enemy's attempts to bring the lies into play. We want to use confessions of who we actually are and what God's promises are. Now, I'm going to close with five suggestions for growing in relationship with God. About every couple of years, I throw these out, and I remind myself to get back to it as I drift away from them. Five suggestions for growing in revelation from God. What we have with Abraham is a man who believed God's promises and a man who was, was, was warned by God, you know, don't, don't be afraid anymore, but believe me. Now, you go, well, okay, that's fine for Abraham. If God, if God told me some stuff, I'd pay attention too. Well, here's the deal. God has told you and me a bunch of stuff. In fact, he's written it down here for us. He's written it down here for us in a way that he, he's going to make sure we know it. I think dreams and visions are wonderful. I think prophetic words are awesome. I mean, I love it. I've got ones written down from years ago. But you know what? There are some of the dreams and visions that I had 40 years ago that I find myself now wondering, did I remember that exactly right? I mean, am I embellishing on what, what I think God said to me or what you know, I think I remembered from that experience? I'm not sure. That's why I start writing stuff down more and more now. But, but the thing is with Scripture, we have an absolute certainty of what God has said, an absolute certainty of the promise that he's given and the conditions, if there are any, that are laid on around it. So what I'm getting to is that we want a revelation from God directly. We want it from his word. We want it through dreams and visions. We want it through prophecies. We want it through whoever God chooses to bring it in. So how do we do that? Number one, number one, become childlike. Become childlike. If you're not childlike, you're not going to get much revelation from God. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus said it. It's just simple humility. It's understanding that pride blocks revelation from God. Pride blocks revelation from God. Humility brings it in to become childlike. Number two, number two, obey what you already know. John 7, 17, obey what you already know. The idea is if God's told you to do something, do it. If God's told you to do something and you haven't done it because you don't like it, and then you're saying, God, what else do I need to do? Don't count on hearing what else you need to do until you've done the first thing that God already said to do. It's the law of use. Use what you have to get more of what you need. If you don't use what you have, I don't think you've got any guarantee that God's going to give you the next thing that you need. Number three, number three, learn to meditate. Meditation has become like a bad word somehow in Christianity. Meditation is a good word. The idea is to meditate for us is not to empty ourselves, but to fill ourselves up. To meditate is to fill ourselves up with God's word. To meditate is to, to take things slowly, to slow down and absorb things, to take things in. Bible reading plans are wonderful. Read through the Bible in a year, but... If you've got to make a choice between reading through the Bible in a year and going slow and absorbing slowly what the Bible says, go slow. Go slow. Absorb it. Abraham Lincoln's law partner said one time that Lincoln read less and thought more than any man in his sphere in America. He read constantly, but he was so slow. The idea is that he was doing what we need to be doing with Scripture. We, we go slow and absorb it. We go slow and meditate on it. We go slow and chew on it and let it come in and do what it's supposed to do. Number four, number four, acquire an understanding heart, and that means basically that we need to, to get in context the the reality of what the gospel is all about, who the king is and what his kingdom is, and how we fit into that, and how the promises of God fit into this picture. It's having, it's having a, a big picture view of the kingdom of God and what it's all about and what he wants for us to do, and it's having, again, primarily, that understanding and view of Jesus as Messiah, as Savior, and as King. And then finally, number five, give God your nights. Give God your nights. And that's very simply where you, you tell God every night before you go to bed, guard my mind, please, Father, from every silly thought, every attack by the enemy that can come in, but give me dreams and visions. Give me your word that comes in. Give me encouragement. Give me, give me things that, that I need to know. And I've been doing it for years, and I absolutely do not get something from God every night but it's happened frequently enough where I keep doing it anyway. And it's another, just one of those methods to, to have God come in and 
I'll, you know, I'll tell you the most recent one. It's embarrassing. Okay. Uh. Turn, turn the camera off. Okay. No. no. Okay. I had a dream last week. And the dream last week was that I showed up somewhere without pants on. And I'm going, I know, I know. And I'm like, this is embarrassing. This is weird. Why am I here? And I'm talking to somebody at some checkout counter in a store. And I'm saying, what in the world? And I, you know, I wake up from the dream. And then my Bible reading that day, first verse I open it to is in Isaiah, where Isaiah is told to take off his pants, take off his clothes, and go around naked for three years. I'm going, <laughs> what in the world? <laughs> Don't worry. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not showing up here <laughs> like that. I, I felt like, I feel like, and I know that's a dangerous word to use sometimes, um, that it's a call to transparency. That it's a call, you know, to, to be transparent. That I, I need to make sure I'm not putting on any, any clothes that don't need to be on. And again, the point is, not about me, it's, the point is that those things come through and, and we need to pay attention to them. We need to pay attention to them and understand what God wants to do with them and act on them, you know, as we do. So as much as, as you can, develop some, some rules for growing in revelation from God, to hear from God, to have a bigger view of who God is, to have an understanding of his promises, and to have a fulcrum of faith in your life where the glory and weight that you give to who God is is always always going to be there so that you can cause it to outweigh the momentary fear that comes in with the circumstances that are going to arise. We're not going to escape all the fear, but we're going to get past it and through it with the faith that's supposed to replace it. Father, we thank you for your love, for your goodness, for your grace. We thank you for the revelation that you've made to us on how big and how good you are. And I, I just ask now today that freedom would come that you'd bless us, every single one of us, with the, the childlikeness, the transparency to acknowledge where we've got struggles and fears and to, to fix our focus on, uh, on you as the one who outweighs all of those. We ask you for that freedom today in Jesus' name. Amen.